afternoon um, for this conversation. I also wanted to say thank you to Grand Canyon University um, in hosting us and for President Mueller's leadership in partnering with the HL Schools across Arizona. I, uh, my name is Sadie Elliott. I'm the training director at the Herzog Foundation. We are a private foundation, and our mission is to catalyze and accelerate the development of quality, Christ-centered K-12 schools so that family and culture might flourish. We were based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Our founder, Stan Herzog, was a businessman, an entrepreneur, a father of two, a devout Christian, and deeply devoted to the principles that this nation was founded on. When he passed away in 2019 and this foundation was birthed, I don't think any of us could have foreseen the um, disruption headed for the educational sector. Mask debates and uh, families forced into home education, heightened cultural tensions, teacher shortages, just to name a few. But in uh, conjunction with Stan's legacy and in the spirit of entrepreneurialism, at the Herzog Foundation, we see disruption as a really positive threat to the status quo and a window for opportunity within the education sector. So enter the school choice movement, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, today's forum, you'll be hearing from some of the leading voices in our nation's most expansive school choice program. Our uh, panel today is moderated by Michael Ryan, the executive editor of the Herzog Foundation's online publication, The Lion. Prior to joining us, Michael spent um, his entire career in journalism in Topeka, Kansas, in Augusta, Georgia, and uh, Fort Worth, Texas. He is a speaker, an author of the internationally published book, The Last Freedom, and we are really glad that we saved you from the Kansas City Star. <laughs> um, uh, throughout the panel, if you have questions, be thinking of those. We will collect those for a time of Q&A later today. And without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sadie. And thank God for the Herzog Foundation after all of that mainstream media mess. Um, I'm actually a product of the first uh, school choice program in the country. My parents said you can either do school or hard labor. <laughs> I'm not stupid, but I went to school. But I ended up doing both. Uh, let's meet our panel. It's a great panel, and you're going to enjoy hearing from them. And starting on your far right, Matt Beinberg. Matt is the Director of Education Policy for the Goldwater Institute, a free market public policy research and litigation organization advancing the principles of limited government, economic freedom, and individual liberty with a focus on education, free speech, health care, equal protection, property rights, occupational licensing, and constitutional limits, and he has no free time whatsoever. <laughs> Matt's work focuses on promoting educational freedom, parental rights, and greater civic appreciation of America's founding principles. He previously worked in human capital consulting for Mercer, where his projects included surveying teacher engagement and analyzing the competitiveness of staff salaries at low-income area charter schools in Los Angeles. He's also worked in Washington, D.C. with Imagine Schools and the Center for Education Reform. Next to me is Jenny Clark. Jenny is founder and ex executive director of Love Your School, a statewide parent-centric nonprofit, ensuring Arizona parents know their school options and connecting them with the resources to make their decision accessible and equitable. She also serves as a member of the Arizona State Board of Education and the Board of Phoenix Seminary. An Arizona native and mother of five, Jenny attended her local district schools, K through 12, and earned a degree in business economics from the University of Arizona. She employs a variety of schooling options for her own family and loves sharing with other families and helping them find the right fit for their kids. And just to my right is Bruce Hermey. Bruce Hermey is Director of School Partnerships for the American Federation for Children. Bruce works nationally with school personnel to help families establish, expand, and defend school choice programs. He formerly served as an educator in the Diocese of Phoenix Catholic School System, most recently as principal of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic School in Tempe, or Tempe, depending on where you're from. <laughs> Prior to that, Bruce was the Dean of Students and taught English literature at Notre Dame Preparatory in Scottsdale. Bruce is the author of From the Schoolhouse to the Statehouse, The Role of School Leaders in Legislative Advocacy Through the Lens of School Choice. And finally, Kyle Maestri. 
Kyle is headmaster of Trinity Christian School in Prescott. Kyle grew up in a Christian home where he was taught to ask hard questions that deepened his faith at a young age. He was part of Biola University's first full graduating class of the Tory Honors Institute, a Christ-centered classical education great books program. He also has a master's degree in educational leadership from Northern Arizona University. In 2003, he helped start a classical Christian school for the Prescott area. He's also on the founding board of the Arizona Christian Education Coalition. Kyle loves teaching, spending time with his students, his family, reading and playing basketball. He and his wife, Annie, have four daughters that they are working hard to raise in the truth of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll let a round of applause for your family. <laughs> to get it started, uh, I'd like to ask the audience, is there anybody here who would like to hear some nuts and bolts about the, how the ESA expansion works and how parents and schools can access it? Would you like to hear nuts and bolts on that? Or are you pretty much versed in that? I don't see any, so we're going to go straight to the meat of the matter. So, my question is, how do we ensure the quality of startup schools so education is education freedom or school choice is seen as a good thing? And if you don't mind, I'd like to start down here with Todd. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I want to thank the panelists as well for the great work you guys have done um, as a recipient of that work uh, on the front lines in schools. Um, I represent not just our own school, but uh, several schools that have just really enjoyed the favor uh, that the Lord has blessed us with through your efforts. So thank you for that. Um, you know, as far as ensuring quality, I think that that's been some of the conversation that we're all having is uh, how can those of us in the seats of school that were already in school leadership, how can we be involved with all of these new startups? How can we have uh, both both a support of the current schools and a support of the of the, the schools that are looking at? But really, as far as marks of quality, it, I would just say that education has never been simply a money problem. So when you think that you've solved one of those major challenges with ESA or school choice things, that's just one piece of the equation. Um, there's a culture to be developed, there's leadership, there's teaching quality, um, there's discussions around the values of the school, those kinds of things. And so I just hope that we are involving those things in the conversation as well. And just really excited about it, very hopeful, so uh, don't hear me wrong on that, but there's uh, there's a lot of great things that have been happening in Arizona in the Christian school movement for many years. And so um, to continue to, to support that and get that, uh, that uh, wisdom that's in the room already to make sure that that's a part of all the excitement that's going on. I think that's maybe one of the things that I would want to say about the quality. It's just, it's an honor to be involved in. It's hard work. I'm sure all of you know. Um, but it's, it's really valuable work to ensure that policies and procedures and leadership values and structures are in place as we continue to so I would like to see us make sure that perhaps we even look at uh, some of the, the school leaders that are already in the mix and say how can, how can we shepherd some of these new voices that are coming into the movement as well as how can those schools be supported themselves in expansion. Um, most of our schools have room. So let's expand those schools as well. I know my school has a wait list of 250 students, and I'm not the only one who's waiting for certain facilities projects and things like that that we've been already working on prior to this that will go on regardless of what had happens with DSA. So maybe I've said too much, but there you go. Never been someone to hide. I thought it was just fine. Okay. Ruth? So what I'd add to that is that there are a number of groups and organizations nationally that are very interested in private school replication right now and are looking for educational entrepreneurs who want to take that next step, be it founding new schools or expanding current high-performance schools. When we talk about performance, I think one of the keys is being true to your mission and finding the resources and people who can help you build off that to serve more families. Um, and then the last thing I'd add to that is, um, when I talk about school choice, I talk kind of about the three legs of the stool. You have the parents who are and will always be the drivers of school choice. You have our legislators who are the champions and framers of school choice programs. And then you have school leaders, who I always refer to as the glue of school choice. 
And I refer to us as the glue school choice because those kids have to have places to take those scholarships. They have to be educated well, and we are the only ones with the data in, in the data we share with their parents that can show that these programs are working and serving kids, and that's both qualitative and quantitative. So being able to idea share, having the confidence and courage to go find what we need. Um, there are organizations now, um, the Christian school sector especially, that are coming out, and I think Herzog is doing some of this work too as well, that will help come alongside you to do those expansions, to do that school founding. Um, but, but people are looking for those educational entrepreneurs out there who want to take that next step to serve more kids. Well, I think you get an A-plus for that answer. <laughs> now, Jenny, this uh, question is special to you. Uh, you brought that up when we were talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So at our work at Lucker School, a lot of what we're doing is helping families find a school option that works for them. So when there is a school, um, maybe that's launched, that's underperforming or not doing well, we end up receiving a lot of those families who are then looking to switch uh, to a more high quality, high performing option. Uh, so we kind of see the brunt of what some of these startup schools that maybe haven't executed on everything that they promised to parents, what that ends up looking like when it doesn't go as planned. So it's very important to me as we look at the expansion of ESA and everything that that means for our state uh, that we are, as both gentlemen mentioned, investing into these high quality options that we're looking at schools that have done it right, that have done it well uh, over, over the years and that we're making sure that we're making investments in them. And then on a more personal level, um, just as individuals and for churches and for believers in the room, I see it as a personal responsibility for us when we're talking about increasing the supply of these high quality schools, we shouldn't just be relying on incredible foundations like Herzog or uh, you know, from state or federal dollars. We individually should be investing in either the schools that our kids go to um, or schools that are serving um, uh, kids at our church as well. We should be making personal investment, encouraging our friends and our family members to give to these schools as well. So they're not just relying on these other outside groups. So um, there's a lot of opportunity there for in individuals to increase their giving to these high quality faith-based schools. Okay. Sure, and I'll just add that, repeating a lot of what uh, Jenny and the others have said, I mean, I think there are probably three things. Uh, one, most broadly, you need to have a policy framework that allows for these options to exist. We're obviously not very fortunate here in Arizona that we have universal school choice through ESAs, STOs, charter schools, everything, right? We, we are uh, an outlier in the country, right? So anytime you think things are a little rough here for any reason, imagine how much better we are than, than other states, and that's kind of reassuring. We have that in place, but to actually make that become a reality requires two other things. One is having providers step up, and two is having parents engage. So I attended four different schools by the time I was in third grade in two different states. And public, private, some great, some not so great. At the end of the day, we tend to hear from opponents of school choice that, oh, these are unaccountable, these are private schools, they're teaching you know, all sorts of, of complaints. And you look at the public school system where we have things like the A through F rating system, and these, these offer some helpful data points for parents. But you think about the sort of grade inflation that we hear about in college or schools, we have grade inflation in things like our, our public schools as well, right? The vast majority of our public schools are rated A and B, and yet we're told that you know fewer than half of our kids are proficient in math and reading. The, the US history knowledge, civic knowledge, right? These things are, are really low, and yet we're told just trust the status quo, trust the establishment, because don't worry, it has the seal of approval from the government. Well, the seal of approval from the government is very different from the seal of satisfaction from a parent and a student. And so I think it's incredibly important that we have providers, many of whom are in the audience and on the panel, who are stepping up to, to provide those options and for parents to be engaged. And if a, a, a resource is great, more will flock to it. Word of mouth is powerful. And if it's not, over time, they move to some place that is. Matt, we'll stay with you for the next question. Where can startups and entrepreneurs get help in, in their startups? And uh, just a hint that the Herzog Foundation is involved in some of them. Sure, yeah, and again, I think the other panelists will probably uh, talk more here. I know groups like, like Jenny with Love Your School, right, who help connect parents and, and schools. You know, one is looking at these existing organizations. Right? You can be a small startup. I know uh, I see Chris in the audience here who just had a fair this weekend out on the west side of the, of the valley offering you know, vendors and, and training for, for tutors and teachers who might want to start a small business teaching, right? There's, there's other established schools here that you can go to and reach out to and say, hey, we're, we're interested in replicating your model, partnering with you, expanding, right? You don't have to do this alone. You're not forging an entirely new path. Maybe you are, and that's great, um, but it really is, again, we've established this framework that says now you can do it, 
And just like an entrepreneur in any other sector, you can chart your own path or you can kind of follow and build up what someone else is doing. Yeah, I love that. And Matt and I were both at Chris's event this weekend and they're working really hard to help um, new education entrepreneurs. Um, Chris and I actually recently spoke about Love Your School is also launching something for new education entrepreneurs um, that we've received some grant dollars for that we're very excited about and thankful for. Um, and it's called our Innovation Hub. And a big part of the Innovation Hub is making sure that when um, parents or people are referred to Love Your School who are wanting to launch these um, smaller options, cottage schools, micro schools, some of those will have the opportunity to grow. So Highlands Latin Phoenix Valley is a great example. Um, two years ago, a Highlands Latin, of course, the original one is in Louisville, Kentucky, part of Memoria Press. Um, they launched two years ago with like 10 students. They're in their second year, they added a second day, and now they're serving 40 students. So with um, the right ingredients and with the right leadership, some of these small startups, they can grow into something bigger. But some, some families will be fine with a small micro school of like six to eight families. So through the Innovation Hub, we're gonna help answer a lot of those questions in partnership and collaboration with other organizations. Do you need insurance? What paperwork do you have to file, if any, with the state? What forms do you want to have? What do you want to charge with tuition? Can you accept STOs if you're just a small private cottage school or is it only ESA? We want to make that process um, easier for those families or individuals or leaders who are trying to get into that space. So um, the Innovation Hub is going to be launching uh, in March on the Love Your School website. Thank you. Bruce? So two organizations I'll throw out um, that I think are, are helpful in this area that work on a national level um, is the Drexel Foundation. Um, they're one that has a fellows program that allows basically a school innovator to take a year to, to set up their school, provide seed funding, helps them set up the framework, and then allows them to start their school and expects it to build and become self-sufficient from there. Um, there's also a group, Open Sky Education, that has a branch called Soaring, um, and they're Christian school-centric mostly. And Soaring um, comes alongside, uh, my understanding is, and provides what you need. So if you have everything on the school side taken care of, you feel comfortable with that as a school leader, they can come help on the business side as well um, and get you structured that way to help you find success there. So there are a lot of these groups out. And when we talk to people at AFC who want to start schools, and, and they inevitably end up with me since I'm a former school leader, I always start with, you know, why? What is your goal? What are you identifying that's saying you need to replicate or you need to expand or that you see something new um, that you want to create because you think, you know, that parents want to take advantage of that and have that opportunity. And here in Arizona over the last two years especially, we've seen pod schools, we've seen micro schools, we've seen new private schools, we've seen new independent schools, we've seen it all. Um, and, and the one common thread is those school leaders recognized an opportunity and recognize the need to have those opportunities. Um, and, and I know I'm grateful because I had multiple instances running my schools where parents came and maybe you had a gymnast who was all world and was gonna be an Olympian. And they wanted to leave every day at noon to go do gymnastics all afternoon. And you had to say, we, we don't do that. Um, and so there was an opportunity for them to find a type of school they needed that could serve their child and still get them the academic success that they needed to go along with the co-curricular. So these opportunities are critical. You know, we're reaching kids in different ways and in different places now uh, than we ever have before. And I think that's why you're seeing the success of school choice, not only here in Arizona, but nationwide, because parents are more in tune with the educational process, they're more in tune with what their kids need, and they're searching out those opportunities. Uh, I don't have much to add other than just that um, I, mentorship is really the key, right? Um, when, when we started our school, um, I was 23 years old, there were 32 kids. I taught on one side of a curtain and a modular, my wife taught on the other side. And we got it going and we learned. And how did we learn? We were, we were mentored by school leaders who had already done it and who helped us. And so uh, I personally have been mentored and have mentored several uh, people in starting up schools. And so I think that's that's a critical piece in terms of uh, these quality schools that are coming up is, uh, and how exciting that is, that God's opening more and more opportunities for parents uh, to make the best decision for their children. So I have a meeting tomorrow with a gentleman who wants to start a school in our town. Um, and so it's just, it's a very exciting time uh, in these 20 years, and I would just say mentorship is, is critical. Just a reminder, we're going to be taking questions from the audience, so if you have a question, write it down on the note cards we've provided on each of the rows. And Chris, my lovely assistant, is handing out the cards right now. Uh, my next question is, what will ensure the future 
of expanded ESAs. Um, apparently, it's not written in stone yet. Um, well, um, this is one of the reasons that over the last couple of years, um, there's been about 40 or 50 of us Christian schools in Arizona that have come together and created a voice. We're now, uh, we've now formed the Arizona Christian Education Coalition this last fall in order to attempt to be really in the mix at the legislature at another level that we haven't been before. So I think to ensure the protection of that, we have to have our voice heard at the legislature. Uh, we talked about having a goal of having every one of our legislators have uh, a picture of our kids on the, on the magnet on their refrigerator so that, that when they're signing bills, when they're thinking about budget negotiations, which is where it's all gonna be this, this session, right? Um, that they are thinking about students. They're thinking about students rather than systems. They're thinking about lives rather than just laws. And so that's our hope that the Arizona Christian Education Coalition, we can gather our legislators to come to our campuses, just as we had Karen Fan on our campus this last couple of years as the president of the Senate. And I know many of us had, uh, have had legislators on our campus because again, we want them to see faces, not just funds. I like that answer. Um, I would just add, you know, one of the reasons I ended up in this position was because I went to a, an event my organization did when I was still principal. Um, and I had no idea that, that the programs were constantly under attack every legislative session to either minimize or abolish them. So threats to school choice is, is not a new thing, but what is the consistent and common thing that allows school choice to continue to grow and thrive is that those who want school choice, parents and the schools that serve them, um, consistently show up, talk to legislators, um, advocate on behalf of the kids who need these opportunities, and ensure that the legislature knows that these things are serving kids well and must continue to serve kids well as they go into the future. When I talk to school leaders, um, I always like to make the point that if you don't speak on behalf of your kids, trust me, someone at the legislature will speak on your behalf and you may not like what they have to say. Um, you have to be willing to engage in advocacy. I know you're busy. I know it's one more thing. I know there are a thousand things in the day uh, you have to do, um, but it's worthwhile. It's, it may be one of the most important things you choose to do. Um, and, and it's just critical not only that you're speaking, but you're making your parents aware of what is going on, especially the parents using the school choice programs, so you can give them the tools to empower themselves to go down and advocate on behalf of their kids. Um, it may seem like a lot, um, it, it really is just something if you build it into your structure and your culture of your administrative team, of your school board, it becomes second nature um, and you can find ways to do it effectively that don't take a bunch of your time and you're consistently informed and keeping your parents informed as well. Cindy, let me uh, switch the question a little bit here. What and who will ensure the future of the program? Well, I would argue uh, the parents will. I think that that's a big piece of what we've all kind of been talking about. Once you have the policy in place, I think the parents are the ones that need to realize how important their voice is down at the legislature, at their schools, and then also advocating and getting more families onto uh, the programs. And so that's one of the things that we've been really focused on is making sure that as we're walking families through the process of ESA, that they understand the process, that they are knowledgeable, that they are equipped, and that they can go then and be the voice. They can go get families signed up um, at their churches, at their local libraries, different um, preschool networks, these places that they already frequent. Uh, I personally believe the growth of the program is a key piece among a variety of other things like the legislative makeup and the advocacy from these groups, but the families are a key piece in ensuring the longevity of this program. Um, one of the reasons why is that we need to remember a lot of the families that are utilizing the ESA scholarship now, they're not all from one political party. And, and we're releasing a video soon with a really neat family and they're, they're Democrats. And they're like, we have never engaged before on this issue, but we are out there, we're reaching out to our legislators. This scholarship has been life-changing for their son that has special needs. Um, and so we see the value of it and we're okay with the universal ESA, even though they got on the program under the uh, special needs category, they want universal because they see how life-changing it is. 
So we need to be finding every opportunity to grow the program, to mobilize families, and to let them carry their voice to their leaders um, and legislators. Matt? Well, I'll, I'll just kind of echo your question and say, you know, what, what do we need to do to protect things like public charter schools? Uh, how many of you know how many kids, I'm short of you who are, have more direct affiliations, how many kids in Arizona are in a public charter school? Any ideas? Just throw out a number, anybody? Yes, okay, so we've got, we've got a policy long there, yes. 200,000 people, 200,000 kids in Arizona public charter schools. Almost 30 years ago, Arizona implemented these things. These are uh, essentially public, public contracted institutions that have been serving kids outside the district schools for three decades. And over that entire time, we've been asking the same question, what do we do to protect this? How do we keep this going? Three decades later, the teachers unions have failed to shut them down, they failed to destroy them, they failed to take them out, right? And that's shown the model that says it does not have to be one size fits all. So yes, every single year is gonna require vigilance, every single year is gonna require making the voice known to policymakers. Some of you may have seen just this week, you had several lawmakers with tons of families behind them, down at the Capitol, essentially standing up to Governor Hobbs, who you know was pr proposing repealing the ESA program, right? This program is now enshrined in statute, and it is protected just like these other other elements of school choice, this is something that's going to continue to require schools, parents, everybody to be involved to make sure, just like we've managed to protect the other forms of school choice over these last 30 years, that we continue to fight for ESAs and, and broader school choice programs. And I'll just mention that you know, things like ESAs help not only private schools, they help at-home educated you know, families, right? You bring these constituencies together and say, a lot of us like to just do our own thing and be left alone. Unfortunately, uh, especially people kind of from the teachers unions, their perspective is that no one should be left alone. They, they want to force their view onto everybody. And so there's, a, I think, a tendency for us to kind of just say, well, we'll do our thing, you do yours. Ultimately, that's not going to be good enough. And it is going to require proactive organization and involvement from everybody here. Well, when we talked to school leaders before arriving here, they didn't want to talk about the nuts and bolts of the law either. What they wanted to talk about was messaging. They thought that, that the key to this whole thing is gonna be messaging. So I've got a three part question. I will give you uh, one at a time on messaging. The first question, and Matt, we'll start with you, is how important is it that, to tell the stories surrounding education freedom? I mean, just kind of frame the issue. Why is this important? I don't think it'll be news to anybody here. I think it's, it's profoundly important, and I won't steal Jenny's thunder, but you know, she's put out some videos, and, and I think telling stories, both with data and with anecdotes and personal examples, makes clear that this changes lives. We've put out reports on the ESA program in the last 10 years. We can cite all the data we want about statistics and numbers, but having a few parents up there to say, this changed the educational life, this saved the educational life of my student, I think lands with a much greater impact than, than almost anything else. Now, parents care about the academics, they care about the culture, they care about are their kids gonna come home with an appreciation of America or a repudiation of all their values and beliefs, right? I think telling these stories in contrast to what's being offered elsewhere makes clear what's at stake here. And, and I don't like to just be alarmist, but we are at somewhat of a clash of both cultures here, and I think it is imperative to, to make those mistakes known so that people do get off the sidelines and get involved. So my judge sometimes of if my messaging at Lunder School is working is uh, often with my dad, who's very moderate in a lot of his different views. So prior to me being involved in the school choice movement, you know, it wasn't really something that he thought about and might even been a little bit critical about. I mean, when I went to public school, my siblings went to public school. And so I recently sent him a video that we did at Lunder School about um, a vendor who basically life was transformed because he was able to start accepting students because of the ESA scholarship. So you've got um, you know, the kids' lives were being transformed, but also these vendors and these business owners. So I sent it to him to see you know, kind of what his response was. And he texted me back and he said, oh my gosh, that video was so good, I cried. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever seen my dad cry. <laughs> He's a tough guy, right? But I thought, okay, this is exactly what I was going for. Like a kind of moderate, you know, person on the school choice issue, very partial to maybe like the public school kind of system because of our own experience. But he saw this story, he saw the impact, not only on the kids, but also this business owner. And it brought him to the point where, you know, he felt really emotional about it. And that is the value of those stories. I want the average person, the average voter, um, to at least be, you know, agnostic on the issue of the ESA and school choice, like to say, yeah, you know, before I was really against it, but 
shoot, you know, I've seen all these stories from all these schools, because we all need to tell these stories of the impact that it's making. And I can't deny that impact because I've seen the kid, I've seen the story. Um, I've you know, had a chance to even have maybe an emotional experience about it. I think that's why the messaging and the positive aspect of the messaging is so, so important. Ruth, I would just say with messaging, the focus always has to be on the kids. Um, at AFC, we have an initiative called Voices for Choice. We've captured over 800 stories from families nationwide who are benefiting from school choice. And the, the constant theme through all of them um, is how the kids are benefiting from the work that you do in your schools um, because of these scholarships. And so those are powerful with legislators. Um, testimony from your students is powerful with legislators. Uh, I saw a young woman a couple years ago in the state of Nebraska, a high school student who came, her name was Jalisa, um, and she ended up um, flipping and motivating a legislator, a legislator who was not supportive of school choice to kind of come to the other side with her story. Um, like I said, the stories are not only impactful to legislators, but um, your communities, it's a testament to the good work you do too. I, I can't add anything other than what I've already said, and that's just the stories of the students. Um, but I, I, I will ask this question, um, and I think that, that most of us will agree that um, who is in the best seat to make a decision for a child? Is it the parent or the state? I think the majority of us would say it's the parent. And philosophically, that's what we're up against, is that question. Are parents in the best seat to make decisions for their children, or is the state in the best seat to make decisions for their children? And so I think that can be very helpful in the messaging as well, is just to make it a really clear thing. We're not anti certain ways, we're, we're for empowering parents' choices. In fact, some of us in the movement at the Christian School uh, Education Coalition, we. We like the idea of parent choice rather than school choice as the way that we brand this. Well, this may be a little repetitive, but my second question is, and as an old newspaper guy, uh, I'm looking at this as a story and assigning it. So, Maestri, what's the story and who's gonna write it? I mean, who is responsible for telling the story to keep this program alive? Well, we've had that conversation as well. Um, actually, we're working to motivate school leaders to have a monthly story coming to the legislators so that they can have a, a story showing up and that we're working on that. Um, but I think it's all of us, honestly. I think we've got to have the hard work of the policy arm doing those, those uh, that work of making the case on to the heads of the legislators, to the budgets, all those things, but we also have to have the hearts touched so that people see the human interest piece of this, that this isn't just uh, a certain philosophical perspective that makes sense practically, that these are actual students, actual lives being impacted. So I, I think it's the school leaders, I think it's uh, organizations like Herzog, I think it's all of us remembering that what carries this movement forward is faces of children, not charts. Can anybody add to that? You want to add to that or move on? Okay, so the third part of the question is, is there a uniform and united way to tell this story? Is there a certain language that you need to use on a regular basis so that you don't communicate it poorly? Bruce, you wanna start with that? So I think uniform, the uniformity in it is, is that it's benefiting kids. Our schools and our kids are all so different. Sometimes it's hard to find one line, I think, that works for everybody well. And, and that's why we always talk about keep the focus on the kids and the fact that they're benefiting. Um, you have your school's mission, you have your school's values, you have your school's uh, you know, activities that take place to benefit those kids. It may be different from place to place, but the bottom line is that when that child graduates, they're ready either to matriculate to high school, they're gonna go off to college, and they're gonna be a contributing member to their society, and it's because of the opportunity that they have the support of their parents in the school they were given to. Jenny, are there better words and phrases to use than others? Yes, I definitely think so, um, and I think we all have benefited from kind of the national conversation around this. Different organizations put out different, you know, messaging and talking points. Um, one of the talking, one of the responses that I regularly have is that loving families always know what's best for their kids. Um, that kind of tackles the argument right there where people try to say, well, I, you know, I'm a teacher and I know this one family and, you know, the child wasn't showing up to school with breakfast or these different things. And my response to that is 
Loving families always know what's best for their kids. Loving families always know what education environment is best for them. Or focusing on the parents, that like parents ultimately know their children better than anyone. And I think broadly from a cultural perspective, we have lost a little bit of that. Like we have a mindset I feel like right now that's like, well, are you, especially for homeschoolers, like are you, did you get a degree in education? Um, do you know how to teach math and science? Well, then you shouldn't be homeschooling your child. And to that I say, parents always know what's best for their kids. And on that note, um, I have seen parents that don't have a college degree, that are um, struggling uh, with housing insecurity, that come from very, very difficult backgrounds still make the most incredible decisions and choices for their kids. And so we tend to hear that from opponents of school choice, like you're gonna let the, the low income mom that you know hasn't had a job in five years decide what school is best for her kid. She can't even do X, Y, and Z. And to that I say, yes I am, because she's still the mom and just because a parent is struggling in certain areas or aspects of their, their life, it doesn't mean that they don't know what's best for their kid. And I think that message also resonates with those parents and also detractors of kind of school choice that we're ultimately saying, we trust those people and you guys are actually thinking less of them just because of their lifestyle or their situation, whereas we're empowering those families and we're saying that we trust them. So that's uh, similar to everyone else, that message of the parent is just um, crucial. Matt, is school choice the best term? I mean, I'll agree with them. I think focusing on the student and the parent is, is more effective than the, you know, obviously Corey DeAngelo's popularizing students, not systems, right? These ideas of focusing on the kids rather than more abstract concepts, I think is hugely important. Um, I do think that there's probably some variation in the messaging depending on your audience. I mean, admittedly, right, if you're speaking to lawmakers who are coming from a red area, red district, they're gonna, they're gonna gravitate toward these arguments about, uh, you know, some of these, these same things of, of parent over the state, right? But then you're gonna have lawmakers who, who are starting from a point of, well, I have a concern for the low-income constituents in my, my area who, out of my own goodwill, I think aren't prepared to take care of it. You need to message to them as well. And I think that there are there are messages we've seen, you know, as mentioned here, there are Democrats who support school choice, there are Republicans who support school choice, parental freedoms, educational freedom, whatever it is you want to call it. And so I think that focusing that message on the student, on the parent, is important, but recognizing and saying, look, we're talking about kids in rural uh, reservation districts that don't have good options. We're talking about kids in the urban Roosevelt district that don't have good options, right? We can't let these kids wait a decade on the hope of change, right? These kids need something now, and if that system's not helping them, we shouldn't be locking them into it, right? So however you wanna modulate, modulate your talking points, I think it is important to recognize that lawmakers, the ones who ultimately are gonna pull the lever on school choice, on education freedom, on parental rights policy, they're coming at this from different perspectives. And so I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all message especially as you're trying to ensure. Unfortunately, we're becoming more polarized. It is becoming a litmus test for left and right uh, for whether or not you support these policies. But there are still some, some moderates on the fence who may not be champions for it, but may be willing to say, yeah, you know what, I'm not gonna push for trying to roll back some of these programs. And if they see those magnets with kids on their fridge and they say, look, I really support public education. I think that's the, the better way to go. But gee, I know some stories of kids who really thrived here. I'm gonna be okay with that. I think you have to take that into account. Next question, we'll start with Matt here. Um, do families or schools forfeit their rights by participating in the ESA program? Uh, no, they do not. Um, again, I assume that there's kind of a varied level of knowledge here of uh, folks, uh, but the, for the most part, I think you guys are familiar with the ESA program. This, as with other school choice programs, is focused on the student and the family, right? This, the way it functions, it gives money into an account, the parents can use that for the child, the Arizona law that authorizes this program is extremely clear that this does not give the state any authority to force or push private schools, homeschools, anybody around to say, now you must choose this curriculum, this creed, you must do X, Y, or Z. So if a family wants to opt into the ESA program and continue to teach their kids at home, they're able to still get curriculum, they're able to still get materials, books, etc. They're not having to decide, well, now I'm doing this with strings attached that say I have to teach my kid according to a prescribed set of state standards. Uh, or we're no longer going to be able to uphold our religious tradition or our background here. The, the existing law for the ESA program is crystal clear when it was built uh, to make this not something that was going to undermine parental authority and private school opportunities, but something to help fuel that. Jenny, is this something that uh, people are concerned about? 
Yes, it's definitely something that people are concerned about. Um, and I see some original OG ESA moms in the back there. <laughs> So one of the things that we really tried to do during the Universal and that um, we've tried to help other states with also is understanding like what's actually happened in Arizona over the last 10 years as it relates to whether or not this state has had any control over the curriculum. Um, so we share our story all the time. Yes, we've been on the ESA program for four years. We buy faith-based curriculum. That has not been an issue. We have not had to report anything. Um, we say talk to parents that have been on the program for 10 years now. So thankfully Arizona's program was around that long uh, because when we have maybe different um, you know, groups or homeschool populations that are concerned or that are critiquing the idea of ESAs, we have 10 years of history to, to say, you might be saying this, you might be worried about this, but we have 10 years of experience to say, that's not the case, that's not what's happened in Arizona. Maybe individual states need to shift some of their definitions related to their ESA program or their homeschoolers. Um, so that could be something to look at from a policy perspective, um, but we have incredible freedom and flexibility in our ESA program to use those dollars and educate our children with the tutors, with the curriculum that we feel like is best for our kids, including the faith-based curriculum. Well, Bruce, one of the questions from the audience kind of tracks with what we're talking about right now, and that is how would you respond to Christian schools who are concerned about taking government money? So I think one thing to understand is that you are not the direct recipient of government funds. Um, in the ESAs and the tax credits, you know, the, the tax credits uh, are awarded to the parents, the ESAs are awarded to the parents, they aren't awarded directly to you as a school. Therefore, you are not the recipient of government funds and therefore you are not necessarily beholden um, to government oversight uh, in your schools. And I think that's an important distinction. I know with EANS, with GEARS, with all these federal programs that came down, school leaders got uh, a crash course in government funding and its possible impacts and, and did it or didn't it affect uh, religious liberties and other things like that, but as it pertains to school choice, you are not the direct recipient of those funds. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would just agree with that. The uh, If you look back to ACSTO versus Wynn, that went all the way to the Supreme Court, the argument between Justice Scalia and the uh, representative party was, is this private money or public money that the tax credits are being based upon? And the argument for the state was attempting to show that, that everyone's income is public money. And Scalia said, excuse me, are you saying that everybody's income is, is uh, state money? And, and he backed off. And so that's a lot of what, all the way went up to the Supreme Court, the argument was that the private schools were not receiving money directly from the state. They were receiving it from the private organizations in that sense. And in this case, the workaround is now to the parents rather than to the schools. I don't receive a check from the Arizona Department of Ed. I receive it from the parent. So we just tell our parents, this is, there's several ways you can fund your tuition. You're going to have to pay some of it yourself probably, but here's some options for you to consider. And so then we don't get into this being funded by the government uh, conversation. Okay, Con, we'll stay with you. Another question from the audience. What would you say to other states pursuing universal expansion? How can schools and groups have a voice from the start of these programs across the country? I, I think, I, I'm not sure I'm the best to answer that one, but I think just looking at the model that happened is there was, there was conversation around uh, groups like Lover School, Center for Arizona Policy, uh, Arizona Federation, uh, the different groups, uh, Goldwater that got involved, and then they actually came and listened to some of the school leaders as well. We were constantly involved throughout the ESA negotiation. We were hearing what were the things that were going on. No, that's that's a non-starter for us. We're not going to accept the fact that you're going to put a testing requirement on us. Okay, yes, we can do that, but not that. So that I think just that model of involving the people who are going to actually be the recipients and experiences of this and the people arguing at the legislature and the advocacy, uh, the, the, the arm of school choice working together. It's a wonderful model. And I think other school, other states should, should follow, follow that lead. It's, a, it's an amazing part to, to, be, to be on the frontier here in Arizona, uh, but I don't see any reason why you can't use the same model. Get parents involved, get school leaders involved, um, get, get all these groups involved like we have here. Now, Bruce, you work nationally with people. 
are, are people across the country looking enviously at Arizona at this point, and what do you say to them? Uh, I, I think definitely there's a lot of people who look at Arizona and want what we have here and are fortunate enough to have through the hard work of, of everybody up here on the panel um, and a lot of our legislators here. Um, the, the thing I would say is um, the easiest thing to do in advocacy is to educate yourself. And if you're in a state that's looking to implement any type or pass any type of school choice law, ask questions. Reach out to people who are doing the work in the state, other school officials. Um, I run our, our school leader fellowship at AFC, so I have a group of now 30 school leaders from around the nation. We train in advocacy and how to interact in school choice in their states and be involved. Those people constantly talk with one another. I have one of my alumni, and, and, and Jonathan back here, um, who participated in our first cohort. Um, it, it's fantastic to see them compare notes on what they have or don't have in their states, and then start talking about what they can do to be involved to make more happen for their families to have opportunities. Um, and I would just say that first key of educating yourself is an easy place to start. The testifying, the writing letters, the talking to the legislators can all come later. Um, but you don't want a situation where something goes through the legislature, you never ask certain questions, and then it comes out and it doesn't work for your school. Um, and I've talked to school leaders in places who say, we don't participate in this because of X provision. And normally my first comment to them was, well, when this was going through the legislature, did you alert anybody to the fact that this didn't work for your school? And oftentimes the answer is no. Um, and, and so I will say this and, and, and uh, pass, uh, pass it on here. Um, you are the experts in education. It's probably not surprising to you that a lot of people in the legislature have never run schools, have never had to deal with what you deal with on a daily basis, and so they don't know, but they are looking for help. They want to know, why does this work? Why will it help people? And oftentimes, um, you know, I call it the parking lot parent paradox. You know, we hear from four people uh, on the same issue after school, and we think we have this giant issue that we have to go kind of research and find. Um, the same can apply at the legislature. If you have a group of 30 Christian schools and you're all calling the same representative because you're located in the same four districts, all of a sudden people are wondering what's going on and why do I need to look at this and should I be voting for this and what information do I need? And you have staff people reaching out to you. Um, you need to be those experts when these opportunities come up. You need to ask questions, see what will work, what won't work, and use your voice so when this comes out, parents have places to bring these scholarships to get their kids served. Jenny, uh, two questions for you. How important are organizations like Love Your Schools to this kind of accomplishment in Arizona? And what would you say to people around the country who may look to your organization and say, how can I do this? Yeah, I think they're really important. Um, I think that we're important, and I think that the work that we all do is crucial because we all are doing things slightly differently. We started Love Your School after the loss of the first Universal ESA expansion in 2018. And I was a brand new ESA parent. I was a part of that process. I, I was new to the program and it was so amazing, but we didn't have that parent base um, that was basically wanting, demanding, um, and just legislative environment and different things. Um, it lost the ballot. And so a big reason that we started was so that we could help cultivate more parents, more engagement, more activity um, to help kind of move this forward if it ever did come back around, which it did four years later. And so as it relates to other states, I mean, I send people to, to Matt and the Goldwater Institute all the time when they have questions about the ESA policy. Um, Matt will connect Love Your School to different states and organizations that have questions about you know ESA from a parent perspective. I think the more that we can connect with each other, that we can network, that we can use each other's strengths and skills and expertise as it relates to you know schools and coaching schools to be involved. For me, coaching parents to be involved the better off we will be in Arizona to keep ESA, to expand ESA, and also get you know, ESAs into other states. So that's a, a huge piece of our work is on the implementation, getting parents on the program, and helping states understand um, the value of the parent advocacy piece. Just to follow up question, is Love Your Schools and are you on the national radar at this point? Are people contacting you? 
think we're getting there. So we did launch in West Virginia this last year, and a big reason why we launched in West Virginia in January of 2022 was because we had, my son and I had gone to West Virginia in um, 2021, and we had you know, been invited by the Cardinal Institute to talk about how amazing Arizona's ESA program was, so they could you know, meet real actual parent, a real actual student, benefiting from the program and there was a piece of that that was like parents were going are you kidding me like this you have this program like this is amazing like yes we want this here but it wasn't the right time then well then of course fast forward and west virginia has the hope scholarship um, which was the most universal esa prior to arizona's so we wanted to be a part of working with groups in west virginia to help with that implementation piece to help get vendors that are serving arizona families serving West Virginia families, because a lot of those vendors are online, helping parents realize what they can do and bridging what we call that imagination gap. So we do have our, our sights on a few other states that might get universal ESA uh, in the next year. So we'll see what happens. All right, so coming attractions there. <laughs> and Matt, we know that Goldwater is on the national map and you were very key to this. What would you say to people in other states who want to do something like this? Sure, yeah, and I know that's probably not uh, everybody here's concerned focus uh, here in Arizona, but I would say a few things. You know, one, Arizona passed this, this universal expansion uh, with the House and the Senate each had a one vote majority. Uh, there were literally no votes to, to spare. Um, there are states with, with much larger pro parent, pro school choice majorities, right? And so I think a lot of states look and say, if someone like Arizona could do that with literally no votes to spare, now it's possible. Uh, I do think that it requires you know, having a, a coalition of constituents and making sure that you're not losing the support of, of your allies. I know there have been a lot of concerns among homeschoolers in, in other states to say, hey, is this something that's going to undermine our protections, right? And, and to, to take those concerns into consideration, to talk to them, to do outreach, to communicate to them and say, hey, look, this is actually something that strengthens the non-governmental school choice, educational freedom, parents' rights movement. This is something that doesn't constrain your, your rights. This is something that actually now returns some of the taxpayer funding back to these families who are doing at-home education or private education to them. And at the end of the day, it's also having having legislative champions. You know, we had some some folks here in Arizona, some lawmakers who were masterful at brokering uh, agreements, right? And, and one of the things that we usually hear against educational freedom is it's going to destroy public education. It's going to defund schools. It's going to do all these terrible things. And what they showed, and what I think the message needs to be elsewhere, is it doesn't have to be either or, right? It can be both. And Arizona, in the same year that we put hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of dollars of extra funding into public schools, we authorized universal ESA expansion, right? And so I think that talking point that says you're gonna decimate public schools, if you look at the talking points from, from the opponents of this, they're not even talking as much about defunding schools because the public schools still have just as much, if not more money, as in the past. Now they're just saying, well, it just costs too much. And it's a kind of ironic talking point that now suddenly there's people saying that funding students is gonna bankrupt the state. But that's not usually a talking point of the, of the teachers union, and yet suddenly these kids over here deserve to be funded, and these kids over here don't. And so I think that there's an easy moral argument to be made that says, look, we're going to invest in the education of all students regardless of the form that their families want to choose. But they're different kinds of kids, aren't they? No, they're not, are they? Uh, last question. Uh, we had a, uh, on the Lion, which is the education news website of the Herzog Foundation, our headline today is Arizona Governor's Plan to Undo Nation's Largest School Choice Program, which you may have heard about, will harm students, advocates say. What would you say to that? And, and I guess the question is, are families that are in the ESA program now or are jumping in, are they endangered by what's going on? Sure, yeah, I can answer that. So, um, as mentioned, the Arizona governor released her executive budget, and I'll we'll actually be talking uh, more about this with, with Jenny, if folks want to chime into a webinar tomorrow. Uh, her executive proposal for the budget uh, suggested repealing the entire universal ESA expansion. Not grandfathering any of those students, literally all 30,000 additional kids who joined just to take away that funding. Now, that's, that's pretty jarring when you, when you read about that. Short answer, however, is the governor cannot do that. So the families who are in the ESA program are safe. The way that the ESA program is built, it is not something that requires an ongoing additional action by the legislature each year. It's not something that the governor can take her pen and veto and say, nope, this program is gone. It is now enshrined in statute. Those families are guaranteed their funding. They are statutorily required by law to get that funding. So the governor can put out her suggestions for a budget. That's no more than if she'd written it on a napkin and handed it to the, the president of the Senate. 
It has no force of law. It requires the legislature. Fortunately, we have the rule of law, and as I've mentioned elsewhere, the ESA program, all of the administration of this program, happens at the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Office of the Treasurer. Those are the two agencies that are charged with distributing funds to the ESA. Those are now run by Superintendent Tom Horn and Treasurer Kimberly. Both of them have, have made very clear they support this program. So yes, I think it is worth us taking into account the, the sort of shot across the bow that, that this uh, proposal represents. And it does mean that there is an effort and a desire and an ideology to oppose this. And so it is going to require from now until the end of time, letting lawmakers know this is not acceptable, but for the families in the program, they are not threatened simply by a proposal like this that does not undo the law. Okay, Jenny, you have 10 minutes for rebuttal, go. <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that. Matt is the expert, which is why I'm having on my webinar tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Bruce, anything to add to that? No, all I'll say is what I said earlier. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for these programs to come under fire, and as we always have in the past, and we will continue to do in the future, rally the parents, all our organizations, and do our best to defend school choice nationwide. Kyle, work hard, but fear not. Yeah, I think we just continue to walk forward and look at these options. I remember uh, those who know me know I, I had a little bit of skepticism when I first came into the school choice environment, worrying about everything from government oversight over Christian schools to what happens if we build a culture based on these and then they go away. And uh, I've just been continually taught to just trust and walk forward and live in the moment that God has for these kids right now and continue to work. And as uh, Steve Yarbrough put it years ago, even if something happens to these programs, it's not as if all of us are just gonna go away and say, oh, well, no, we're gonna think hard, we're gonna pray, and we're gonna go up with something else. You've changed me and you can't change me back, right? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring this to a close by inviting the president of the Herzog Foundation, uh, the Reverend Dr. Daryl Jones, to come out here and uh, say a few words. But first I'd like to say, uh, all evidence to the contrary, this was totally unrehearsed, and I'd like to have a nice round of applause for the panel. Absolutely. Thank you to Dr. Michael Lightstrom, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Excited to see so many different organizations and schools that are all speaking for the same mission, and I think as Christian schools, you know, speaking for the Herzog Foundation, as well as charter schools across the country, and private schools across the country, all begin speaking with one voice, and locking arms to recognize this whole education freedom. I love parent freedom, parent choice option. Uh, I will say having traveled the country and spoken to educators across the country, K through 12 educators, what you have in Arizona is the envy of the nation. And so it's, it's, uh, it's exciting for us to be able to stand with you and to have this dialogue. If you enjoy this conversation, I will simply say that uh, Grand Canyon University will be continuing the conversation with a panel discussion much like this on February the 6th, right here on this campus, right here in this very room. So uh, you're welcome to be a part of that as well. Again, thank you to the panelists for, uh, for making this a uh, riveting afternoon, a great conversation. Thanks for all of your work and for all of you that are really on the front lines of educating children. As education choice really becomes an option across the country, the statistics will record that students do better, that children learn, that it's not so much the competition, it's the options that are now available to help students. One last thought, and that is simply as, as Michael referenced earlier, hfschoolbox.com is an online platform that helps individual homeschool parents create homeschool co-ops. Or, or churches create schools, whether it's a hybrid school or a five-day-a-week school, a classical school, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a neighborhood cul-de-sac that wants to, uh, wants to have a, a, a school outside of a church or inside of a church, HF School Box is an online free resource to walk you through the necessary steps uh, to move from the passion of we want a Christian school to actually launching it. And uh, if there's any sweet spot uh, or any secret sauce to HF School Box, it's that then we'll assign and pay a mentor who's running a Christian school like what you want to build, and we'll pay them to ride shotgun with your launch group because what we care about is more Christian schools across the country. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the work in the classrooms. God bless you.